Hi, everyone, and welcome to our last session of Fit for Fellowship, a survival guide for the first year general cardiology fellow. I'm Megan, and uh, welcome back. And thank you for joining us. So tonight is our last session of the California ACC Fit boot, uh, boot Camp Lecture Series. On behalf of myself, as well as my colleague, Stacy Sai, I wanted to thank our tonight's speaker, as well as all the speakers who have contributed generously to the Boot Camp Educational Series. This could not have been made possible without their uh, wonderful presentations and their Q&As and their uh, assistance in this. Additionally, this would not have been made possible without the support of Scripps Cardiology, um, as well as California ACC, and we truly thank them uh, for their contributions. The boot camp is available free of charge um, on California ACC Fit website, as well as the YouTube channel. So feel free to come back uh, to them at any time. And they'll be available for your, your references. We hope that this program uh, brought much needed resources um, as well as help to the cardiology fits, especially those just starting their training um, and hopefully will help uh, throughout the course of their entire training. So let's get started with our first speaker, with our last speaker. Um, so this is Dr. Teresa Danielli. Um, she received her medical degree from Ross University School of Medicine and completed her internal medicine residency training at Brown University. She then completed a fellowship training in nuclear cardiology at Columbia University at their New York Presbyterian Medical Center campus before going on uh, for fellowship in cardiovascular disease at Yale University. Now she currently works at UCSF Fresno and is part of their medical educational program as well as integral part of California ACC as well. So we thank her very much and we look forward to her excellent presentation. Hello there. I'm Teresa Danielli. I'm a cardiologist. I'm the chief of cardiology at UCSF Fresno and the fellowship program director for our cardiovascular training program. It is an absolute pleasure to be up with all of you here today speaking about surviving fellowship. You have all been in fellowship now, at least the first year fellows, uh, for approximately two and a half months. And uh, it's, it's an exciting time in your life. Um, it's a challenging time in your life. And hopefully with some of a uh, few tips and tricks that we will talk about, it will help make your three-year venture a little more manageable and, um, and resourceful. All right, so let's get started. I'd like to initially talk about some characteristics of internal medicine residents who actually successfully match into cardiology fellowship. So that is all of you. What um, in particular uh, attract people to our cardiology subspecialty world? So this is going back, this is resident demographic information pre-residency. And you can see coming out of medical school, it's a 50, it's, it's more predominantly male, but it's closer than it has been in quite a while. Um, it's a 40, almost 60 split between men and women. Here's a, a breakdown of uh, whether they attended a US public medical school or private, whether they are uh, foreign medical graduates, um, the average age, um, and where they've attended school. The majority of this information has been obtained by the MATCH, National, Re National Resident and Matching Program website. You all have access to this. Feel free to, to, um, to search on this website. It's actually quite interesting. You'll get all kinds of information. So let's look at the subspecialty of cardiology. Here are the fellowship match trends by specialty and appointment year. And you can see here, the dark blue is number of programs and teal is programs filled. And in red here are the actual programs filled. And you'll see under here, it's pretty much the same, but instead of programs, it's actually positions filled. And you can see steadily from 2017 to current 2021, we have very happy to say, we have increased the amount of programs available um, that provide cardiology subspecialty training and have really increased the amount of fellowship positions available. As you can see, it is a very competitive fellowship because you'll see the unmatched programs are very few. 
and the unmatched positions are very, very few. And when we look at um, total applicants, you can see that there is more applicants than programs available. Obviously, you just going through the, the match process um, understand this more than anybody, right? Just because you apply to cardiology is not a for sure, um, uh, for sure thing that you are going to match that year. And you can see how many unfilled positions there are every single year. Just a few years ago, we were under 300 and now we're over 500 unmatched positions per year. Um, you should feel very, very fortunate and grateful that you are one of the lucky few. Here is a table looking at the number of positions of different subspecialty uh, training programs every year. And if you see, you know, if you down here, when you go under internal medicine, you will find cardiovascular disease. And you can see that the amount of programs, the, excuse me, the amount of positions per year is over 1,000 positions per year. Um, there's a small cohort of the advanced heart failure transplant above and below is EP. Um, but you can see the number of subspecialty positions are, are almost double, if not more than double, in a, with, amongst all the other subspecialty positions. Having said that, it is a very competitive program, as you are aware and we still have a good amount of patients, or excuse me, fellows who do not um, match. Now, when we look at subspecialty training applicants, um, and we look at uh, by gender, and what we find here is all subspecialty applicants that are the percentage of female is not very much, okay? It's under 40%. And to me, that's disturbing as you, uh, you know, 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, we have not really made significant strides in this. Um, the amount of U.S. graduates is about the same that go into cardiology. The amount of foreign medical graduates are about the same. And the percentage of DOs that go into cardiology is, is low as well. But there's your breakdown. When we look at cardiology, on its own, the percentage of females is in the 20th percentile here. When you look at advanced heart transplant, um, advanced heart failure and transplant, it's a little higher made up of women. When you look at electrophysiology, it's, um, it's very, very low. Interventional cardiology, not surprising, is the lowest although we have been making some strides in the last two years, which is great. All right, so there's your gender um, breakdown. Uh, what, kind of, what kind of fellows go into, or what kind of residents actually go into cardiology as a subspecialty training field? Well, we know there's two main types of people, and you may be one of either a type A personality or type B personality, right? And I have to tell you, uh, for after many, many years of, 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 of training cardiology fellows, they are mostly type A personalities. Think about all your cardiology faculty, all your, your attendings that you round with. Most of us are type A personalities. We do have some type Bs, and I have to be honest, the type Bs are a little more challenged to train, but nonetheless special. Um, so, you know, why climb a mountain? Because it's there, versus why climb a mountain? Um, well, because it's there, I don't climb a mountain, right? Because there's a mountain, I'm just gonna take the path of least resistance. And why is this important? Well, when you're looking at cardiology, um, and going into, into any kind of spe uh, subspecialty training or fellowship for that matter, but especially cardiology, um, there's a very steep learning curve, especially the very first year. You will feel like an intern all over again. You're overwhelmed. It's, it's a whole new, you know, you may, you may be in a new institution. You may be in a new hospital. Um, you have to learn all, you know, all you, do, you have to meet all kinds of new people. And all of a sudden, July 1, we, um, 
uh, expect you to be the cardiologist on, on duty and the cardiologist specialist when you're seeing these patients. So I want you to start at the beginning. I mean, you're picking up subjective symptoms and you might feel very overwhelmed or, um, or um, you just may not know, uh, you, you don't know what you don't know at this point. Um, and, uh, and then as you progress into a little more into the year, you've got your symptoms in, into kind of actionable terms. And then you read, read, read and put together a differential diagnosis. And then you finally get it. And that is going, you're going to have this evolution through the first year. And you're going to build on that every single month and every single year until you finally become um, a cardiology trained specialist. So don't feel overwhelmed. Take the time. Try to be a type A personality as much as you can because you want to be aggressive and you want to learn as much as you can. You want to have active learning, not passive learning. And this is just a little schematic because you see all kinds. So I'm sure one of you, each of you has a trademark and now you know what it's called, right? Are you the bolo tie? Are you the pretzel? Or are you the adrenaline junkie? We see a lot of these, uh, a, a lot of the ER um, residents, fellows and attendings, as well as the pulmonary critical care have their special little uh, stethoscope holder on their, um, on their scrubs. Okay. How to succeed in fellowship. I actually polled my fellows. I polled my fellows and said, all right, you know, give me some tips. What do you, um, what do you think um, are, are things that uh, are needed in order for you to succeed in fellowship? Remember, you know, you go to grade school and it's little things. You're worried about snacks and recess, right? You go to college, you've got some, you've got some paper assignments, you've got some, um, you know, assignments to do, but then you go to medical school and, you know, it's, it's the, it's the, the, the water has been released and, and you're drowning until you figure out how to manage it. And hopefully by now you have all been, um, uh, or you should by now have learned to be very successful in uh, grasping a lot of information all at once and you know how to put it into different compartments and process it. Um, but this is what first year is all about all over again. You're gonna feel like you're right back day one in medical school. So some tips on how to succeed. Number one, scrub in for every single case. Um, when you scrub into every case, know your patient. Don't just scrub in because you want to get a number, right? You want to get that 10th that cardiac cath for the day. That's not how you learn. Some of the best interventional cardiologists are fantastic imagers and they're great clinicians. Um, and that is very important because you, bet, you then know how to better take care of your patients. So scrub into every case, be aggressive, but know about your, your patient. If you have, if the patient is coming in for a PCI for chest pain, I expect my fellows to have looked at their nuclear imaging, to have read the stress test, to know that they're on two antianginals and have exceeded and maxed out medical therapy before that patient is even brought to the lab. And, and what else could you have done before that patient has come to the lab and needed intervention, right? I want them to give me um, you know, alternative treatment modalities and why CAF is now the next resort, right? Or if they had a high-risk stress test, tell me why they had a high-risk stress test. You should know that. And that is, that's how you're going to learn. That's how you're going to know how to better take care of your patients. Teach as you learn. I can't emphasize this enough. You, you have Hopefully all of you have the opportunity to have medical students around you, residents around you, and your, um, your, when you become a senior, second, third year fellow, you have your first years. Um, as you are learning, you go back and tell the medical student. You go back and tell your residents, right? When you present a case to the attending on call overnight or any time during the day, you go back to your residents and say, this is why we're going to do this right? And go look at those guidelines because that you, you have connections there and, and you won't forget. And you're, you, you know, the more you teach, 
the more you yourself are not going to forget that concept. Be a team player. I, this came from all of my fellows. I mean, I can't stress this important this enough. This is so important. Remember, fellowship is an exciting time of your life, but it is also a marathon. It is a marathon. You're not going to succeed by going full throttle for the first year and then think you're going to do okay in the third year. You need to pace yourself. You need to help one another out. And, and, and it's a matter of everybody, all your fellows, your whole cohort of fellows, you all get to the end line and you all learn at the end. That teaches you character, that teaches you skills on, on how to be a better partner when you go into, into, into subspecialty, uh, in, excuse me, into private practice or academic practice. That is a vital necessity um, when you're learning to deal with the real world. And, and, and I always tell them to get a, a big girl job or a, you know, a big guy job. Okay, befriend the device reps. Very important, right? You, you start fellowship and one of the most nebulous areas for almost everybody is EP. Everybody just says, I know about pacemakers. I know when I need to give a, a nice, get a nice CD, but how the pacemaker works, what they need to do to, 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 um, uh, to make sure it's working properly, that's a whole other ball game. And, and so befriend the, the, the device reps. They are very resourceful. They will teach you how to interrogate a device. They will teach you how to read those interrogations. Don't be shy. They don't expect you to know. I don't expect you to know. I'm sure your faculty don't expect you to know coming fresh out of internal medicine residency. But we do expect you to get more comfortable as time goes by. And you're only gonna do that by, by um, you know, being active and, and, and ask those questions. So the device reps are your friends. Oftentimes they have resources for you. They have educational programs that they provide. Um, so they can be of a great resource. Know the equipment. Very important. You at the end of the day or the end of three years will be the specialist. And so as simple as this may sound, when you're in your private office and your EKG machine is not working and they say, doc, I, something's going on, they're gonna to look to you. When you're in the hospital and your EKG tracing looks off, you're the one that needs to figure out if the leads were misplaced, right? Um, same thing with the echo machine and the, EK and, the, and the nuclear imaging camera. Know your, your equipment. Understand how images are created because if you understand how images are created, then you will understand how artifacts can come about and you will become a much better reader because you are not going to be um, reading something that is not real. So know your equipment. And that is how you become a better interpreter of all our cardiac testing. Don't be a procedure robot. That kind of goes along with scrub, scrub in for every case. Don't be a procedure robot. I want you to scrub into every case you can, but remember, you are not a technician. You are a physician. You are not just a, um, a someone who's going to go in and open up a lesion. Understand what you're doing. Okay, so, so some people will just, you know, reflexively want to do procedures. We call them procedure hogs. You, I think you all probably know of one or two around you. That's all they want to do. And that's okay. But they have to understand why they're doing it. And they have to understand if that procedure is actually going to benefit the patients and what are the alternatives and what the guidelines state around it. Don't fall into that trap. Research. I get some fellows that absolutely love research. I get some fellows who absolutely hate research. Um, we will talk about research a little later on in this, in this, in this presentation, but do research that you love. If you have no desire to go into EP, then don't do EP research, right? Because you're going to hate it. You're not interested in it. Um, I always try to match up research to your interest. And sometimes you may not even know 
that EP is an interest of yours. So sometimes that comes a little later as you get exposed to an EP rotation. Um, but, and I'm using EP as, as an example, but it, can, it, it holds true for any other um, sub, uh, little subspecialty of, of cardiology. So do what you love, because if you love it, you're going to be successful in it. Study, study, study. Do not get into the rut of being way too busy year one with no reading and you're just surviving. There's a lot of fellows that they're just surviving. They're on call, they're on call overnight. They're so busy. Um, you know, life happens. We're not in residency. Every, all of you guys on the screen are, are probably in your late twenties to early thirties. People are getting married. They're having families They're having children. Life is busy, but remember, don't cheat yourself. You have three years to become a master at your, at your, at your craft before you go out there and people are putting their lives in your hands, right? And um, you have a little bias. I, I think cardiology is a very important, um, an important field. And it's also a field, it's very rewarding but it's a dangerous field. If you don't pay attention, you lose lives. You can, you can kill people if you don't pay attention. And so take this three years to carve out a reading schedule, whether it's an hour before you go home, whether it's an hour before you go to bed, whether it's, you know, two hours on the weekend and make yourself a schedule and hold yourself accountable and make sure you, you have to make sure you stay on track. It is so easy to fall behind. And after the first year, um, your learning curve is exponential. And if you put some reading on in there, it's, it's even more so exponential. And so I can't stress that enough. Network to succeed. This is hard for a lot of us, right? It's hard because you know, you've been on this train of medical education. You go to medical school, you know you're there for four years, you keep moving. You apply to residency, you're on a train for three years, you know where you're gonna live for three years. You get to fellowship, you're on a train for three years you, with no stops and you keep, you keep moving. So it's, it's it, you know, we, we don't, we, and we just keep doing what we're supposed to do. But remember, the final stop is, is going into practice is 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 the beginning of your is your your professional career that's when you finish fellowship whether you finish at cardiology or you go to subspecialty fellowships that is the end and so you don't want to start looking the day you graduate you want to network before you want to take that time during those three years and, and go to the American Cardiology Conferences. There is a fellow in training um, group. Go to all the group, uh, fellow in cardiology, excuse me, fellow in training um, uh, sessions that you can get your hands on. If you're interested in intervention, go to some interventional conferences. Get to know the leaders in the field. One great way is with the American College of Cardiology. Um, start start, you know, reaching out to, this is California, the California chapter or wherever it is that you, that you are and say, I'm a fellow and I want to get involved and you will be, you'll meet people. You'll meet people all from Southern to Northern California to Central California. And that, and, and, and let me assure you, all, some of the best jobs are, are already filled before they're posted. Keep that in mind. And so network to be successful is direly important. And that starts year one. Do not wait to your third year to branch out and make connections. Lastly, enjoy your life. Um, there's nothing more stressful than being on call 24 hours and um, being in a, in, a, in a new environment away from home, away from family, um, and try to just suck it up and survive. I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's a miserable three years. In order for you to be successful, and I know this is easier to say than to do, but believe me, you just have to carve it out in your time. 
um, is number one, eat properly. Try to eat properly. Do not live on the vending machines throughout the hospital. Number two, get some exercise in there. Okay, this is not for just cardiovascular health. It is for mental health. It decreases your stress. It makes you more motivated. It makes you, it definitely makes you more successful in, in, in your daily activities. Um, carve it out. It's got to be, it's got to be part of your morning routine or evening routine or twice a week or three times a week, whatever you can. Um, get groups together, get a group of residents together, start you know, we have a basketball league here at our hospital. Um, they had a soccer league a few years ago. And it's, you know, and it's a great way of networking with your co-residents, co-fellows, medical students. And you, you, um, you, you, and if you're somewhere where you don't have friends and family, you will make them. But you have to have balance. And that is direly important. All right. Reading materials. Everyone is going to give you their suggested reading material, okay? Take their suggestions, but it's got to work for you. Number one, don't forget, you are the specialist, okay? Don't read study guides, study questions. That's great, but you have to read a textbook, all right? You can't just go on YouTube and say, hey, tell me about this. That's great. I'm not downing YouTube. Some of them have very, um, very thorough lectures, and that's fine. But you need to read, whether it's a textbook or, or, or a video. It has to be an in-depth um, evaluation of, uh, in order for you to understand the pathophysiology of the disease, why we treat, why we treat the way we do, and look at the guidelines, right? So go to the American College of Cardiology website, look for new trials, guidelines, et cetera. What I tell my fellows, print out all the major guidelines and know them, okay? Know when you have an update. So, so it's got to be a multi-pronged approach. Number one, read, okay? Get to know the pathophysiology of disease. Go back to your anatomy, right? Go back to your anatomy. Um, figure out where things are, especially if you're going into a structural interventional uh, subspecialty or you're in imaging, you're going to need to know that. Um, you know, why do we need to treat it? What are the outcomes if we don't treat the disease? Go to the American College, Cardi College of Cardiology website, print out guidelines, know your major guidelines. And then when you are taking care of a patient, you can tell your attending, I treated them with ACC guidelines, a class one indication is this, I, or I didn't do a class one indication because of this, so I did a 2A indication. And if you do that from the beginning, when you're studying for your cardiology boards, you'll already be ready for your cardiology boards. You won't need to go back and memorize anything because you have incorporated it into your daily, daily um, education. I cannot stress this enough. Please do not rely solely on review books, study guides, and study questions only. From time to time, we get fellows that do this. And it is very obvious, very obvious. There are major lack, or there's major gaps in their medical knowledge. They will know what to do, but they won't know why they're doing it. And, and that's a major problem because as you should know already, not all patients will fit into the guidelines. There's exceptions to everything. But if you don't know um, why we do things the way we do, and you just look at study guides that say, do if someone has chest pain, you go to the cath lab and make it a very loose um, example here. You're not going to know when they should go to the cath lab, when they shouldn't go to the cath lab, and what you could do if they have kidney disease and you don't want to take them to the cath lab. So do not rely on, on just those alone. Study books, review books, study guides, questions are very important, but you should do them in conjunction um, with, with looking at pathophysiology of disease first. Um, that should come second, not as, as the only way to study. 
And remember, the evolution of learning does not just, you know, this is for, this is just learning in general. And I always tell my first year fellows, take this as the onion, right? You have an onion, you are here, the outer core, right? And you strive to peel back the onion to get to the inner core here. And this is what it is, right? This is the initial, the external voices, positions. This is what, you know, you do something and your faculty says, your attending says, no, do it this way. And you take that and you say, okay, I'm going to take that. And I'm going to believe it. And then as you keep learning, you are actually reading and you're going to be in the persuasive category where you're actually going to take a position against that attending and say, I disagree and give them the reason why. I disagree because that's not guideline based. I love hearing that out of my fellows. And then as you get better and better, you're going to be analytical phase. You're finding patterns. You have categories, there's relationships, you know, it, and, and when you're going to, a lot of patients are going to present very similar, you're going to find certain patterns and say, well, this patient is in cardiogenic shock and that patient should go to the cath lab, or this is a type two demand MI, they don't necessarily have to go to the cath lab, you can be a little more analytical about it. Um, and you really strive to get to this inner core here the descriptive phase where you're, you're, you're providing adequate information, you're reproducing information, you have, you have a basis to and a deeper understanding of what is happening. And so um, it's like an onion, as I said, you've got you've to uh, take this as a stepwise approach. All right. Please don't forget while you're learning and going through the stages of the onion and learning all this, to, you know, this, it goes along with, um, you know, taking care of yourself and enjoying your life. I want you to look at this picture here and realize how worried the patient looks because of course their intern here or first year fellow looks disheveled, tired, unshaven. Um, he's got papers coming out of his pocket here. Um, and crashes at the end of the day after he's drinking his soda, his Starbucks. Um, I think that's an M here, McDonald's and, and fries and everything, all the other junk food that he could keep and keep get, get his hands on. Um, when you walk in a room, put your, if you've never been on the opposite side and never been a patient, put yourself in that position for a second. You're scared, you've had a heart attack. You then have a physician coming in who looks more tired than you do, unshaven and so forth. And in, you have to, you have to get a, you have to learn how to gain the trust of that patient. Um, and in order for you to gain the trust, you have to look presentable and and be confident. And if you're looking a little more worry if you're if you're looking a sicker than the patient itself not going to happen and you're just going to crash and burn so don't forget all right so another little cartoon here of the stages we've all been there medical student top left intern you've got your coat on you're excited you've got your resident your residency for some reason you decide to drop the coat because you don't need all that and then you finally become an attending and you, you basically have your stethoscope. That doesn't mean you don't have clothes on. Um, you've got your stethoscope and you're like, well, can I borrow a pen? Because you bring nothing with you other than a stethoscope. You don't even bring your pager with you. Um, nowadays, we all have cell phones, but nonetheless, you bring nothing with you. I want you to think about your transition. I mean, we've all been here, okay? And if you feel like this, all of a sudden medical student where you're bringing your calipers with you and you've got you've got your magnet for the different devices and all kinds of stuff that is normal in your first year you're going to feel like an intern all over again totally normal you will then second year and third year and be in this stage and finally when you graduate you're going to be back to an attending hood so it is completely normal to feel scared and overwhelmed everyone goes through it but you will get there. Similar, 
This is the initial sign out, right? You got full color copies. You all recognize this. Then you get to the intern sign out. You got your to-do list and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to the attending. And where's your sign out in your head? It always amazed me when I was a, a, a resident how I would have everything written down and my attending would know it and just know it, just memorize it. And when I, and then I got there when I graduated and then I felt horrible because then as a, a first year fellow, I was right back to this initial, you know, sign out of a very extensive, I have to write everything down. What was, you know, you got the right heart cap. What was the, what was the wedge pressure? What was the PA diastolic, systolics? What's the cardiac output? I'd write everything down until you finish and you could just recall it. That comes with time, comes with experience, um, but you will get there. Don't feel um, frustrated. Okay, research. Talk about research. ACGME requires six months of research for a cardiovascular training program. So, excuse me. So every ACGME required um, cardiovascular training program requires six months of research. Now, six months of research um, could be done in many different ways. It could be six months of dedicated research time, or they do two months per year. Some, I mean, it is just, it depends on the program and what they do. Um, but it, this can be divided any, any way. Speak to your mentor early on for ideas and do what you are interested in. I cannot stress that enough. Um, if you are doing something you have absolutely no interest in, you are not going to be passionate about it. You're not going to care about it. Um, but it is part of that training program. So a lot of the fellows say to me, you know, I have no idea. Fellowship is hard because I don't know, or excuse me, research is hard because I don't know what to do. I, I didn't come in with ideas. Um, well, you don't have to have ideas on your own. The best thing to do is to speak to your mentor. Everyone should, you guys should all be assigned with a mentor early on and say, look, I need a research project. Do you have any ideas? Do you have anything going on? Um, or I may be interested in this and they can, they can, um, they can, they can connect you with other faculty that have pro have things going on. Okay, this is just a schematic coming out of gastroenterology um, for fellows. And this is the roles and responsibilities of mentees, mentors, and program directors in a research pro program with, um, uh, with, with a training program. So there are many ways to approach research, okay? You can come and find a question Okay, if you have a question in your mind, you find you know, your mentee and you go into participate in conferences, interact with visiting faculty, go to your program director who's then going to give you resources and protected time, um, or you identify research methods, um, you know, you find a mentor. I mean, there's many ways of going around this circle here, okay? But the way I always tell my fellows, the way you should start is ask questions, right? Ask questions. Why do we do this as opposed to that? And if we did it somewhere, if we did it differently, then what would that look like? And if you start out with a question, you further develop the question, you write it up, you define it, you keep reading, you seek feedback and it all starts from there. Okay, so, um, you know, a lot of fellows find it hard because they, they come in and, and even my, our fellows, they come in and they, and I, by the second year, I said, well, what is your research project? Well, I don't have one. I don't know, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, why have you been waiting so long? Have you met with your mentor? What are you interested in? Let's talk to some of the faculty. Um, so, there's many ways to go around it, but I don't, the most important thing is don't feel like you have to come up with a question and the project yourself. Um, speak up, talk to your mentors, talk to your faculty members, and they usually have a project going on. All right. This question always comes up, subspecialty training. Um, should I do subspecialty training, right? 
And I want you to look at it in, you know, ask yourself four things when you're thinking about subspecialty training. Number one, are you passionate about a narrower focus or are you happy doing what you're doing, right? Do you want to be the absolute expert in a tiny, in a smaller focus or are you good doing everything in cardiology? Will additional training help you reach your goals? I had a fellow, um, this comes up frequently and they say, I want to do interventional and I want to do an additional advanced imaging fellowship. And I said, well, why? What are your goals? What do you want to do? And they say, well, I want to be an interventional cardiologist. And I said, okay. And they said, and I want to read CTAs and coronary calcium scores. And I say, well, I think advanced imaging is fantastic if you're going to do structural. Um, but in many institutions, they offer, they're already doing structural. And in our institution, we do structural. We ha happen to have advanced imaging here. So how is that additional year of learning CTAs going to help you reach your goal of becoming an interventional cardiologist? If you feel that it is, then you do it. But if it's not, then there's really no need to pursue it. Do you know enough about the specialty? A lot of times people think they want to go into something um, and then when they get into it, they say, uh, actually, not really. I really didn't want to be in the lab inducing PVCs all the time. My EP colleagues, I always um, joke about that. If, if, if going into the lab and inducing arrhythmias is your thing, great know what it's about before you get into it. Do some electives in that specific rotation before you decide. Does the lifestyle suit you? So if you're one that does not want to be bothered in the middle of the night and don't want to come in taking care of a STEMI, um, then interventional cardiology is not for you. If you are not one to read imaging all day, then imaging is not for you. Um, and so you have to look at that subspecialty training and does the lifestyle suit you? Please don't forget fellowship is three years. The beginning of your career starts when you graduate. And if you don't care for the late night or the early morning wake up calls, it's not gonna get any better in, in, in training, excuse me, in, in practice. It's definitely not gonna get any better in practice. And so, you got to make sure it's, it's the lifestyle is what you're looking for. And next, does it make sense financially, right? If you are, there's some fellows that I have that just want to do multiple subspecialty fellowships. They want to do, they think they like heart failure, so they do heart failure. They do uh, preventative and they do all kinds of stuff. And I say, look, you're wasting all these years. Does it make sense for you to do a preventative if you want to practice general cardiology? Does it make sense financially for you to do all these additionals if at the end of the day, you're still going to be training and, and you're still going to be practicing under the general cardiology uh, purview? And so you kind of have to look at all of these to figure out where you want to go. Career choices. This is a big one. I mean, we can have a lecture all on career choices. Where do you go? Please know that there are basically five main avenues. There are others that you can create, but mainly five. You go into a private practice model. You go into an academic practice. You either go fully on research. You go into industry or administrative or a combination of all or both. Private practice, when you're looking at career choices, you've got to look at the pros and cons between a large practice model and a small practice model, right? Do you want to be on call every other day if there's two people in your practice? Or do you want to be on call every 10th night or five weekends a month if there's 10 of you in practice? Gives you a little more flexibility. Do you want to go into an academic practice? Remember, if you want to go into academic, there's grant funded academic practices where you've got to do research and get your own grant funding. <coughs> Excuse me. Or a hybrid model where you have a clinical practice and academics with fellowships and research and so forth. 
And so there's many different avenues when you're thinking about career choices. Be true to yourself. Write it down. What do I want to do in three years? Do you see yourself in a practice? Do you see yourself teaching? Do you see yourself? Are you tired of taking care of patients and you just want to go to industry, right? You just want to go to research. You just want to, you just want to go manage practices. And that's okay. You do administrative. You could be a CMO, right? Chief medical officer of the hospital. So be true to yourself and do know that there are many choices out there and with many variations of all of this. Um, speak to your mentors about um, you know, what you're looking for and what would suit you best. When you are in practice, I want you to keep this in mind. You don't realize this when you're a fellow, but I could not, I, I can't tell you how important these bullet points are for you. When you're in private practice and you're building your practice, remember you're referring physicians, this man here who specializes in referrals to specialists, we all know the types, um, has choices. And if you make that person feel like a fool where you call them and say, this is a nonsense consult, why are you sending it to me? That will be the last time that person sends a patient to you. If your studies are under are not understandable, in other words, I tell my fellows all the time, your conclusion on your echo reports, your conclusion on your stress testing should not be nebulous. It should be reader friendly. Because if they don't understand, guess what? They're gonna send it to someone who is understandable. Respect your colleagues, follow up. If they send you a patient, follow up. And remember, communication, trust and credibility is going to be what is going to make you successful in practice moving forward. So do not underestimate the importance of every single bullet point here. As a fellow, and I hear fellows all the time say, we're on the consultation service and they've gotten 15 consults for the day and they say, I have a bogus consult for sinus bradycardia, asymptomatic sinus bradycardia. We've all seen it, we're all gonna think it, but never say it out loud to your, your provide your, 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 your referring provider because to them, cardiology is not their specialty. And for you, those are bread and butter cardiology consultations that keep you in business, right? And I would much rather them consult me than them missing something because they're afraid that I'm going to criticize their decision. Okay, we're at the end of the day, we're taking care of people's lives. So when you graduate, um, don't sell your soul. For now, keep calm. You're going to be great. You're going to just enjoy this, this new venture in your life. You're going to make um, amazing uh, friendships. You're going to make amazing um, uh, friendships with your faculty. Um, you'll be fine. Don't sell your soul. I tell my fellows the last day I see them before, I, before they, they run off into the real world is I say, if I see that you become one of those that are doing stress tests every six months to a year, I will call you. I will hunt you down and I will call you and say, what did I teach you? You are, te you are dealing with patients' lives. Never forget that. Be proud of yourself. Have fun. This is the beginning of an amazing adventure. Best of luck. Thanks for the time.